Okay, today we are going to do, we're going to pick up in Acts chapter 4, verses, uh, verses verse 12. We're going to look really just at one verse, and we're going to, from there, we're going to launch into uh, just a very basic study of soteriology. I say it's basic, we're going to look at some uh, Hebrew and Greek words. Um, it, it really is basic, uh, uh, and we're going to just kind of get a snapshot of just a few words and look at some verses. And remember that whenever we're looking at the meaning of a word or a, or a subject, uh, we always want to let context determine meaning, right? Uh, and so we're going to do this when we look at, look at certain words. And remember, we've talked about this many times, that, that, that the rule for meaning is always determined by context. And that when we're looking at a word, we're, and that's what we're going to do, we're going to look at uh, certain words as they appear, and I'm going to give you the Hebrew, I'm going to give you the Greek, but we're going to look at the context, and we're going to ask the question, you know, what does the context tell us? Does the context tell us this? Does it tell us that? What can we extract from the biblical context? And so that's going to help us in our understanding uh, today as we look at the subject of soteriology. Soteriology. Now, if you were to ever take a class on, on systematic theology... Uh, you would again cover certain what they you know different ologies. You would cover you know bibliology, which is a study of the scripture, how we got the scripture. You would deal with doctrines of inspiration, uh, how how the Bible came into existence, you know how it was inspired, being uh, the word of God and the word of man. You would study theology proper, which is the study of God Himself, doctrines of the Trinity, uh, you know doctrines related to the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Uh, you would study angelology. Uh, the study of angels, you would look at uh, elect angels, that is angels that are not fallen, and you would look at fallen angels, we, re we typically refer to them as demons, and then you would look at among fallen angels, you would look at them categorically, you would look at uh, Satan for example, and then you would look at demons, and by the way we're going to get into the subject of demons as we work through uh, the book of Acts a little more, we're going to study different doctrines as we move through this study, we've already hit ecclesiology, right? And so today we're going to look at um, soteriology. As we hit these different doctrines, we're going to do sort of a, a, a snapshot view and just kind of um, uh, get, get a little bit of an understanding of these things. But soteriology, what is that? What is that? Salvation. Yes, it's a study of salvation. It's exactly what it is. And so when we talk about soteriology, we're talking about a study of salvation. And what prompted this was when we came to our passage in Acts chapter 4. And what's the context? Uh, Peter was preaching in, in the temple, remember? And he was in the middle of his message. Uh, he's got this man who was lame and he's clinging to him. And, you know, imagine you guys got his arm around Peter's neck and Peter's kind of, you know, got this guy hanging on him. And he's, but he's delivering this message. And we don't know <laughs> that was the picture. But Peter's preaching this message. John's standing beside him. They're in the temple. He's giving this message. And people are responding. And what's the message? He's preaching the resurrection. Uh, and the Sadducees are upset, not because a miracle has taken place. I mean, they can explain that away. You know, there's, there's no, there's no uh, content, there's no doctrinal content in the, in the miracle. They can, you know, they can explain that away. But, but when Peter starts giving content information and explaining the resurrection, well, you know, the Sadducees don't like that. that that's upsetting their theological apple cart, so to say. And so it disturbs them. So what do they do? Well, they have Peter arrested, Peter and John, and the lame man, right? And then the next morning, they call them in, uh, place them before the council, the Sanhedrin, the 70 um, officials, and they put them on trial. But then what happens? Peter turns it around. He says, you, he puts them on trial. He says, you are the ones who crucified uh, the Messiah. But God raised him up. And so Peter is speaking out of boldness and confidence. Remember we talked about how he's filled with the Spirit. He's seen the resurrected Christ. He's filled with the Spirit. He's speaking with boldness here. And then we came to that verse in Acts chapter 4, verse 12, in which Peter says, and I'm going off the notes here, he says, and there is salvation. And the word salvation here translates the Greek noun soteria. Soteria, and I've given it to you both in the Greek and in the English. And the word means deliverance or rescue from harm. Uh, deliverance or rescue from harm. And by the way, the word salvation has a from and to aspect to it. A from and a to. Um, and so you're taken from something to something. Uh, and, and sometimes the emphasis is on the from, like from danger. And sometimes the emphasis is on the to. Like, like we are uh, saved, but where are we going to? Eventually it, it's the, the to is going to be to glory, to heaven. Right? 
Uh, when, we think of, uh, when we think of John chapter uh, 14, verses 1 through 3, when Jesus is in the upper room and he's explaining to the disciples, he says, look, I'm, I'm going to leave and where am I going? I'm going to prepare a place for you. That where I am, there you may be also. For in my Father's house are what? In mansions. Right? I'm going to go and prepare a place for you. And that's the two aspect. And so when, he's, when, when you're thinking of that, when, you, when you're thinking about one of those benefits of salvation, that's, that's the two aspect. So when you think of salvation, there's a from... And there's a two. And so when you, when you see that word, think, think in that regard. And then Peter just narrows it down. He says, and there is salvation in no one else. And so he narrows it down to the person of Jesus Christ. For there is no other name under heaven that has been given among men by which we must be saved. And the word saved here translates the Greek verb sozo. Sozo. And um, in this context, and context again always determines meaning, this is going to be a reference to spiritual salvation. Spiritual. Now what we're going to see is that sometimes the word sozo, and we saw it last night in our study of Matthew, where sozo actually refers to physical salvation. Because we saw the disciples, they were on the boat, there was a great storm in Matthew 8. Uh, Matthew 8, 25, we're going to look at that here in a little bit. But in Matthew 8, the disciples were on a boat, there was a great storm, Jesus was sleeping... They come running to Jesus and they say, Save us! Right? For the storm is about to destroy the boat. Well, they're not asking for Him to save them spiritually. They're asking to be saved how? Physically. Right? But it's the same Greek word. And so again, it's one of those issues where context determines meaning. And so we're going to look at that a little bit more as we move into this. Uh, now I have a quote here from Dr. Lewis Berry Chafer, an article he wrote in Bibliotheca Sacra, which is a theological journal. And the title of the article is called Soteriology. And he gives a simple meaning here. He says, as to the meaning of the word salvation, the Old and the New Testaments are much alike. He says, the word communicates the thought of deliverance. The thought of deliverance. Safety, preservation, soundness, restoration, and healing. But though so wide a range of human experience is expressed by the word salvation, its specific major use is to denote a work of God in behalf of men. And that is a very important phrase. That, uh, it, that its specific major use is to denote a work of God in behalf of men. In other words, God saves men. And we'll see this time and time again. Jonah says salvation is of the Lord. Titus 3.5 He saved us. And that's very clear. You see those statements. Uh, it's not He saved us with a little help from ourselves. <laughs> it's not We saved ourselves and God approved of it. It's He saved us. Turn that arrow. Yeah. Uh, it's He saved us. And so you know, this is going to be a repeated theme when you look throughout the Scripture. That, that again, he says it's specific major use is to note a work of God in behalf of men. So who does the saving? God. God does. Man, helpless. Mm -hmm. Helpless. And we're going to look at some key verses. Romans 5, 6 through 10 is a very important passage. Ephesians 2, verses 1 through 3. Because when you look at what the Bible has to say about man, what's, what's, what's the picture? <laughs> And what? It's not awesome. Yeah, she, it's a dark picture. We have gone astray. But we are dead. Helpless. Powerless. We're godless. I mean, it's a dark picture. We'll look at some scripture. Um, but people don't like that estimation. But the reality is, is that in order to be saved, you have to, you have to admit that you need help. You have to admit that, that you're in a, in, a, in a position where you need it. Okay? And the gospel is good news. Um, but we often have to have the bad news before we get the good news. By the way, the gospel is the solution to a problem. That's what it is. And people don't often think about that. But it's the solution to a problem. But we must understand the problem before we can understand the solution. And salvation, salvation from what? I mean, we often have to state what we are being saved from. And so we have to get into that. Uh, and, I, and I've given some definitions here. Uh, soteriology comes from two Greek words. Uh, soter, which means savior or deliverer. And logos, which in the Greek means a statement or a speech 
But in English means the study of. The study of. So when we talk about soteriology, uh, theologically, soteriology is the study of salvation, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to narrow it here, as it has been uh, revealed biblically. As it has been revealed biblically. So we're going to keep it within the biblical, biblically context. The most common Hebrew word in the Old Testament is yesha. Sometimes you see it in, in, in another form as Yeshua. And the word Yesha means deliverance, rescue, salvation, also safety and welfare. And that's taken from the BDB or the Brown Driver Briggs Enhanced uh, uh, Hebrew English Lexicon, which is a, a common Hebrew lexicon. But it means deliverance, rescue, salvation, also safety and welfare. But the word primarily had a physical, uh, an idea of physical deliverance. You see it in uh, many instances, like throughout the Psalms, where David talks about being saved from his enemies. What's he talking about? Look, David was a man who knew what it meant to stand upon a field of battle. And to have blood dripping from his sword. And to face a real enemy. And when David talked about being saved from his enemies, that was a very real deliverance in his mind. I mean, in his mind, that word saved had a very physical aspect to it. Okay? And so when David talks about being saved from his enemies, he's thinking very much of a military uh, aspect. Okay? He's thinking of physical deliverance. And by the way, the word has that uh, uh, meaning in many passages. We'll look. We'll see these. We won't, we'll, I mean, I've given you, trust me, I've given you a hundred scriptures in here. We're just going to hit maybe ten or twelve. But we'll look at it. Uh, and I'll go on here in my, in my quote here. Salvation is our quote. is my word. Salvation in the Old Testament was primarily physical as, again, one might be delivered from an enemy in battle or from a plague. Go with me over to Psalm 44. Psalm 44. Verses 4 through 8. Psalm 44, verses 4 through 8. And by the way, you know, I, I, I brought it out one time, and um, when you look throughout the Old Testament, have you, have you ever seen the phrase when you're reading through some of the, even the hymns, where it talks about Lord Sabaoth? And you see the, uh, it, it looks like the word Sabbath, but it's spelled with an O in there. Uh, it looks like they misspelled it and they put an O in there and it's Sabaoth. Have you seen that? You know what I'm talking about? Have you ever seen that spelling like in some of the hymns and it refers to Lord Sabaoth? You know what that word means? It means Lord of the armies is what it means. And it refers to God who led the armies of Israel into battle. And so God would, would lead the armies into physical battle. Uh, but when you look at, uh, at for example, in Psalm uh, 44, um, verses 4 through 8, David here, he says, uh, um, well, it says here, it says in Psalm 44, it says, You are my king, O God, command victories for Jacob, though... Uh, through you, we will push back our adversaries. And again, they're thinking again, very physical contact here. Through your name, we will trample down those who rise up against us. For we will not trust in. For I will not trust in my bow, nor will my sword save me. For you have saved us. There's that. There's that. Yesha. For you have saved us from our adversaries, and you have put to shame those who hate us. In God we have boasted all day long, and we will give thanks to your name forever. And so again, when you see the word Savior, again, it has that very physical uh, aspect to it. Quoting here from Dr. Ryrie, he says, The most important Hebrew root word related to salvation in the Old Testament is Yesha, as I've already mentioned. Originally, it meant to be roomy or broad in contrast to narrowness or oppression. Thus, it signifies freedom from what binds or restricts. And it came to mean deliverance, liberation, or giving width and breadth to something. And he says here, faith was the necessary condition for salvation in the Old Testament as well as the New. Abraham believed in the Lord and the Lord counted it to him for righteousness. So when he talks about here uh, being saved, he talks about being basically opened up into something, that you're in a very narrow space in a space of confinement. And so, again, it's this idea of this to, to uh, this from to 
concept as I mentioned. Now moving away from the Hebrew, from the Old Testament, Yesha, uh, we move into the Greek New Testament. There's primarily three words related to soteriology. Two of them we've seen already in Acts 4.12, but let's go over them briefly here. Um, the first one is the Greek verb sozo. Sozo. And sozo refers to the act. Again, it's a verb, right? And what does a verb do? It, it describes action, right? And so sozo refers to the act of physical deliverance. The act of physical deliverance. Go with me over to Matthew chapter 8. Matthew chapter 8. And we were there last night, and we'll look at it again. So we'll get the, the, the sense of, the, of how the word is used in its context. How the word is used in its context. So we get into Matthew chapter 8, and the context is, is that Jesus, in verse 23, it says, when he got into a boat, and he's trying to get away from this crowd, remember? Uh, when we look back in verse 18, Matthew 8, 18, it says, now when Jesus saw a crowd around him, he gave orders to depart to the other side of the sea. And we talked about how many times when Jesus saw a crowd, he tried to get away. Now Jesus wasn't in the crowds. Um, you know, and so here's an example where he sees this crowd and he decides to depart. I kind of relate to that. I'm not really into crowds either. So he sees this crowd, Matthew 8, 18, and he decides to depart to the other side of the sea. Uh, verse 23, of course, he's, he's intercepted. There's two disciples. He has this interaction with these two disciples. Verse 23, it says, When he got into the boat, his disciples followed him. And behold, there arose a great storm on the sea, so that the boat uh, was being covered with waves. But Jesus himself was asleep, right? So here's Jesus. He's in the boat, and this, there's this great waves about him, and Jesus is very relaxed, right? Uh, there's no Old Testament passage that says that Jesus is going to die by drowning, right? On a boat, out in the sea. How's Jesus going to die? Crucifixion, right? So there's no Old Testament passage that says he's in any kind of danger here, so he's relaxed. Verse 25, And they, the disciples here, came to him and woke him, saying... Save us, Lord, we're perishing. Now the word save us here is the same Greek word sozo. Now are they calling out for eternal life? Is that what they're doing? No. They're asking for physical deliverance. Save us, Lord, we're perishing. And it's a physical perishing. They, they feel that their life is physically in danger. Right? And we would do the same. Now, he's going to insult them here in a second. He calls them a... What, is, what does he say? Right? He said, he said to them, Why are you afraid, you men of oligopistos? You men of little faith? Right? And uh, we're that way too. I mean, you know, being honest. Uh, and then he got up and he rebuked the winds and the sea and it became perfectly calm. And they were amazed and said, What kind of man is this that even the winds and the sea obey him? And what kind of man is this? Well, it's the man who, before he came in hypostatic union, spoke the universe into existence. That's what kind of man this is. Um, but again, the verb sozo here, context determines meaning. And as we see the verb used in this context, I think it clearly demands physical salvation, physical deliverance, right? And yet when we see it in, uh, in the Acts 4.12, it, it's not talking about a physical deliverance. When we put it back into the context of Acts 4.12, it's not a physical deliverance that is being discussed there. It is a spiritual salvation. Uh, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, right? That whosoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. So when we talk about salvation in those sorts of passages, uh, we're talking more about a spiritual life there, right? Uh, let's look at another passage. Matthew chapter 14, verse 30. Matthew 14, verse 30. Now, this is another example where Sozo appears. So it appears. Now, here's, here's, um, here's uh, the disciples. They're out on the water again. There's another storm going on. Only this time, Jesus is not with them. And Jesus comes to them. And here we have the event where Jesus is what? He's walking on the water. Right? Verse 26. When the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified. And they got scared. They didn't know it was him. They thought it was a ghost. Um, and they cried out in fear. Well, they did a lot of crying out, apparently. Um, right? <laughs> uh, 
Uh, they cried out earlier on the boat, or crying out here, you know, a lot of crying out going on, so they're, apparently, they're, they're accustomed to crying out. Um, and again, we, you know, we were, we're kind of hard on them sometimes, but, you know, if we were there, we'd probably do a little crying out ourselves. Um, and, and, and immediately Jesus spoke to them, saying, be, you know, take courage, it's I, do not be afraid. You know, Jesus was, you know, telling them on many occasions, don't be afraid, calm down, you know, he's comforting them. Uh, and Peter said to them, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. And Jesus said, come. And, and, and here's, here's a great moment for Peter. Right? I mean, here's a, here's a great moment. And he said, come. And Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water and came toward Jesus. Now, can you imagine that step? I mean, come on. Peter had been on the water as a fisherman most of his life. And Jesus said, come, and Peter, he stepped. Anyway. But then Peter has another moment, doesn't he? But seeing the wind, and no doubt the waves, he became frightened, so his faith turned to fear, and he began to sink, and he cried out to the Lord, so, so! There's that verb again. Well, what's he crying for? Eternal life? Physical. Physical. Right? I think when we look at the verb in its context, it demands what? Physical salvation. Physical deliverance. And immediately Jesus stretched out his hand and took... See, Jesus doesn't reach out and say, believe on me and you'll have eternal life. Right? <laughs> That's not the solution to his problem. Right? Does Jesus save him? How does he save him? By giving him the, telling him to believe on him? <laughs> It reaches out and takes him by the hand. And, and you, you wonder, how, how far did Peter get? You know, was he up to his nostrils? Save me, Lord, save me. You know, is he bubbling through water? You know, is he, you know, words coming out through bubbles? Or, you know, and you often wonder, I wonder about these things. My imagination. So anyway, sozo, save me. So you got the verb here. Okay, so let's look at a few. So next we go to the other word, soter. And soter is the word uh, we see in, in uh, soteriology. Soter means savior. Means savior, and it refers to the one who rescues. So in this context, even though Jesus is not referred to as the savior, he nonetheless is. But he saves in a physical sense, isn't he? When he reaches down and he takes Peter by the hand, he is referring. He he is the one who is the savior. He is the one who is saving Peter, and that's what a soter is. A soter is one who rescues or delivers another from harm or danger. Go with me over to Luke, Luke chapter two, verse one. Luke chapter 2, verse 1. Again, we're very short on time, so we're just going to hit just a few verses. The notes are here. You can chase all these down if you want. But again, I think we're looking at enough to kind of give us the sense of, of what's going on here. Um, uh, wrong. Oh, 2.11. I'm sorry. 2.11. I said 2.1. 2.11. Uh, Luke 2.11. Uh, and this is actually the angel talking. Um, verse 10, But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy, which will be for all the people. For today in the city of David there has been born for you a what? A Savior. A savior. That's soter. That's the Greek word soter. Who is who? Christ the Lord. And so here, soter refers to the one who rescues or delivers from danger or harm. And so here it is the Savior, it is the one who is going to bring eternal life, it is the one who is going to provide salvation. Uh, and let's move on to the next word. The next word is the word soteria, and it's the one we saw over in, in Acts 4.12. And soteria is the one we saw in, in Acts 4.12, and it means, it refers to the provision of salvation, to the provision of salvation. Uh, to the provision of salvation or, or, the, or the provision of rescue or deliverance brought by another. Okay? So it refers to that which is provided or received. In other words, when we talk about receiving salvation, it is that which is actually possessed. That which is actually received. Okay? So you have the act of saving, you have the Savior, the one who delivers, and then you, we have the salvation that is actually received which we actually possess. And let's look at two passages. Let's look at uh, 2 Timothy 2.10. 2 Timothy 2.10. And 
And again, you, you get this from the context. And we'll actually back up to 2 Timothy 2.8. 2 Timothy 2 to give us a little, little context here. But again, you actually see the form of the, of the word here in the Greek when you're reading through this in the passages. In 2 Timothy 2.8, Paul is here talking. He says, Remember Jesus Christ, risen from the dead, descendant of David, according to my gospel, for which I suffer hardship, even to imprisonment as a criminal. Uh, Paul suffered unjustly. Uh, but the word of God is not imprisoned. By the way, wasn't that true in Acts? Because even though Peter and John, and the healed guy, the, 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 the healed, we don't know his name, but the lame man who had been healed, they, they spent the night in jail, but the word of God was not in prison, was it? Because thousands of people got saved. And that's what Paul is in effect saying here. He says, for which I suffered hardship, even to imprisonment as a criminal, but the word of God is not in prison. No man. And I thank God for that. Oh, yeah. I get me started. Verse 10. <laughs> Verse 10, for this reason I endure all things for the sake of those who are chosen, so that they also may obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus and with it eternal glory. Now catch this, so that they may obtain, there's the receiving, that they may obtain what? The salvation. Do you see that? They are receiving it. They are obtaining it. Look, when you believe in Jesus Christ as the Savior, at that moment you obtain the salvation. And here, here Paul is looking at it with what? That anticipation of future glory, right? Future glory. And so this passage very clearly in the Hebrews 1.14, just flip over a few more pages, to the right. A few more pages to the right. Hebrews 1.14. And here he talks about angels. Angels. And here he's talking about angels. And by the way, this shows the ministry of angels. We talk about the ministry of the Holy Spirit, which convicts, convinces, reproves, and deals with the hearts of people. You know, as a minister, I go forth and I, and I give the Word of God to people. I share Scripture. But beyond that, it is up, it is up to the Holy Spirit... Uh, to, to, to work in the heart of that person. Oh, look, I don't have to argue that person into the heaven. That's nonsense. I, I have met so many believers who, who ram, cram, and jam the gospel down people's throats, and all they do is frustrate people and give a bad name to Christianity. You, you're, you don't argue people into the heaven. That's nonsense. Don't ever do that. Okay? Isaiah is very clear. When the word of God goes forth, it, it, not you, it accomplishes what it was sent to do. Okay? So, simply get the scripture and then leave it alone. Okay? Because the word of God is alive and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. The word of God is alive, but you're not powerful. It is powerful. The word of God is alive, but just simply put it out there. And let it do its business. And the Holy Spirit will work in the heart of that person. One man plants, another man's waters. But listen to me. It is God who gives life. It is God who causes the growth. All we have to do is just simply put it out there and then walk away and let God do His business. And often when we get out of the way, God will do His business. Ah, but guess what? It's not just the Holy Spirit. Angels are involved. Ooh, did you ever think about that? Well, here it is. Hebrews 1.14. Are they, and this is a reference to angels, are they not all ministering spirits sent out to render service for the sake of those who will inherit salvation? And there's our word, soteria, who will inherit, that is, receive salvation. And don't you wonder how many angels were sent by God to follow you around as a child and protect you until the day you heard the gospel and believed and received eternal life? And some of you probably needed a whole herd of angels. You? Okay, we got some double-handed raises in the bag. Yeah. Some of us probably needed more than others. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. For sure. Okay, well let's turn over and I'm going to read through some of these quickly. Uh, in eternity past, God determined to create man in His image. He determined to create man in His image. Even though He knew man would fall into sin and be completely unable to save Himself. However, from eternity past, God also decreed to provide salvation through the death of Christ. 
And this provision was not based on any merit or worthiness in sinful men, but is founded solely on His love, grace, and mercy. Salvation is never what men do for God, but what God has done for them through the substitutionary atoning work of His Son, who bore the penalty of their sin on the cross, and who freely gives eternal life and imputes His righteousness to those who believe in Christ as their Savior. In effect, salvation is completely of the Lord. Go with me over to Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5. And you know, there are certain verses that you really ought to have in your, in your memory. Really ought to have in your, in your mind. And Romans 5 verses 6 through 10 is, is such a great passage because it contrasts the sinfulness of man with the work of God to save. It contrasts the sinfulness of man with the work of God to save. And what is it that man brought to the cross? What is it that we brought to the cross regarding our salvation? Sin and death. That was our contribution. Sin and death. That was our contribution. And Christ bore our sin and died. He bore our sin because He didn't bear His own. Hebrews 4.15 is very clear. That He was tempted in all ways like we are and yet was without sin. So for whose sin did Christ die? Not His own. He bore our sin. 1 Peter 3.18 He died, the just, for the unjust. Why? That He might bring us to God. That He might bring us to God. That's, that's the greatness of God. But that's the cross. For while we were yet... What? For while we were still... What's that word? Help us. And by the way, you might underscore some of these words. You might... You might underscore something. While we were still... Because this is you. This is you before you came to cross. We were helpless. Now these are very clear words. For at the right time Christ died for the... What's that word? That's you too. These are all unflattering words, so bear with me. We're going we're gonna un, to unflatter you for a little bit. For one will hardly die for a righteous man, though perhaps for the good one, good man, somebody might dare even to die. But God demonstrates His own love towards us in that while we were yet, what? Sinners. Sinners. That's you too. That's another word that Paul throws. Now, Paul's not giving a flattering view here at all. By the way, high view of man, low view of man. Low view. Now, by the way, that's, that's true for babies too. And people say, oh, baby, cute little baby. Listen, that's a little sin nature wrapped up in a cute little body. Yeah. It's exploding in a cute little body. Yes. But as that little body develops, that little sin nature develops. And guess what? That little sin nature can grow up to be an Adolf Hitler, a Joseph Stalin, a Pol Pot. Because that little sin nature has the propensity to produce anything that every other person within the history of the human, na uh, human race can produce. And people say, ooh, cute, and I think, mm. <laughs> I, I know what's in there and what that is capable of. And the propensity of a child is what? Sin. Selfishness, sinfulness, manipulation. Proverbs says, foolishness is bound up in the heart of a child, and the rod shall drive it far from him. That's not... <laughs> Now I see children hiding. <laughs> you, you can come out from underneath the table. <laughs> That's what the scripture says. It's, again, it's, it shows even in, even in the youth. Verse 9, much more than... And now, not all children are the same, trust me. Some children are very good-natured. Some children are very easy to come around. I mean, not all children. I, I needed the witness, I'll tell you. I was a strong-willed child. I, I confess. I did. I deserved every one of them. But, you know, it's like the Hebrews. Hebrews 12 says, He whom the Lord loves, He disciplines. Like a, fa like a father, His own son. Because discipline doesn't display hatred, it displays love. Anyway, a whole other sermon. Uh, <laughs> verse 9, Much more than having now been justified by His blood, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through Him. For if while we were what? Enemies. 
We were reconciled to God through the death of His Son. Much more, having been reconciled, we shall be saved by His life. So we were helpless. We were ungodly. We were sinners. We were enemies. All low views of man. So what were we saved from? Death. Sin. What are we saved to? Life. We are the children of God. What have we been given? Not what we deserve. We are brought into the royal family of God. Children of the living God, brothers and sisters to the King of kings and Lord of lords, robed in righteousness by His blood, paid a price He did not deserve that we might have a life we could never earn, and a heavenly kingdom that we will enjoy for all eternity. I mean, what a blessing. That's grace. That's mercy. That's love. And, and how do you not say thanks? How do you how do you not just want to just bow in adoration to what he has done? You know? I actually want to stop here. And I was going to try to get this in one lesson, but I don't think I'm going to do it. I think I want to come back and do this in a, in a two-part, if you'll permit me. Um, so let's go ahead and, and stop here. And, uh, and I'll come back and we'll look at a few more verses and we'll, we'll unpack this a little more next week. And we'll do this in a two-part uh, session on, on soteriology. Is everybody okay with that? Because mm -hmm. okay. I think there's enough, uh, enough in here that we can definitely spend more time in the Scripture. And I think it, I think it would be a, a benefit to us for future reference. So that as we come through this study more often. And by the way, as we move more through the book of Acts, we're going we're gonna to deal with a number of doctrines. Okay, We're going to deal, we've already hit ecclesiology, we're in soteriology. We're going to hit angelology. We're going to hit demonology. We're going to. We're also going to get into theology proper. We're going to deal with subjects like like tithing. We're going to deal with all sorts of subjects as we move through the Book of Acts. We're going to deal with a bunch of doctrines and stuff, and these are all very relevant to us, very relevant because they speak to real life issues. They speak to the world in which we live, right? And uh, and, and we want to understand these things um, because they help in our everyday spiritual life. Okay, right? Any questions over what we've hit so far today? Any questions or comments anybody has? Pretty straightforward? Is there a halfway hand up back there? Okay. Yeah, in, in, in my Bible, um, in Psalms 44, verse 4 through 8, it says, at the very end it says, Selah, S-E-L-A-H. What is that? Ah, that's a very rare question that comes up. <laughs> I didn't know what that was. Selah. Uh, as best we know, and, and, and there's really no definitive answer because most Hebrew scholars really don't know what the Sela is that appears in the Psalms, uh, the S-E-L-A-H. Because mm -hmm. there's a period before it, a period after it, like that's a whole statement. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Now, you find that throughout the Psalms. Uh, the best answer that I have ever heard given on the Sela that appears, remember the Psalms are songs. Okay? So does it mean like amen? No. No. It's actually considered to be a pause. That you're so singing. It's huh? It's a verb. Yeah. It, it, it's, like, it's like when you're singing through the song, pause, pick up the next part of the song. And so it's actually written in the song as, as, a, as a visual cue to the, to, to the person or to the choir as pause. And then pick up and sing. And so, Selah. Or Selah. So, that's, that's, that's the best answer I've heard. Now, yeah, or, <laughs> don't say anything. Okay, no, no. But, but really, um, there's no absolute definitive answer that anybody really knows. But I saw it, a lot. I was like, in, in, in the 22 years that I've been teaching, you are the first person to ever raise that question. <laughs> <laughs> I'm assuming everybody already knew what it was. <laughs> See? Yeah. Very few people know that, right? Any other questions?
or comments about today's? <laughs> yes, ma'am. And that's, and that's what we have to leave a little extra time for. Okay. All right, well, let's close with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we are so thankful that we can call you Father. We are just so thankful, Father, that, uh, that you sent your Son into the world into a place of darkness and hostility, into a place that by and large uh, was a place where the majority of men in this world loved the darkness rather than the light. And that was demonstrated by how they treated your son and how they ultimately rejected him and nailed him to the cross. But in doing so, they actually accomplished your will. Because He went to the cross and died for their sins. And Father, in Your magnificent wisdom and sovereignty, Father, You sent Your Son, not to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through Him. And Father, we are so thankful that in eternity past, You thought of us. And as Christ hung between heaven and earth, that He had us personally in mind. And the Scripture says that because of the joy set before Him, He endured the cross, despising the shame. And Father, He was mocked and He was ridiculed. But because of the joy set before Him, He could endure that. He could endure the beatings, the scourgings, the crown of thorns, and he could endure all of those things because he knew that it pleased you and because he knew that it would result in our eternal life. And his sacrifice is our gain. His suffering is our life. Father, we are so thankful that we can believe in Christ as our Savior that we can come with the empty hands of faith and accept the free gift of eternal life by simply trusting in Him. And Father, right now we pray that as we go forth this day, that we will be challenged by the things that we've studied, Father, that we might grow thereby, and that we might have a greater sense of appreciation not only of Your Word, but of the things that You have done in our lives. For Father, we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank mm -hmm. you.